first, first female Lord Justice Clark. And the Lord Justice Clark, for uh, those of you who may not have in-depth knowledge uh, of the Scottish judicial hierarchy, generally has responsibility for criminal matters within uh, the appeal courts. Uh, she has been, I know from my workings with her through the Judicial Institute, uh, a, a very energetic uh, campaign in relation to a number of matters, including most recently for us, concerns about um, advocacy. And by that I mean the kind of questions, repeated um, bullying questions that are sometimes encountered in trials and how judges can best intervene to deal with that, having regard to the enhanced need to look out for the interests of witnesses and indeed vulnerable accused. Uh, so, without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce Lady Dorian to the talk. Um, and hopefully there'll be an opportunity to do that, if not before the end of the session, then maybe during the coffee break. Um, it's often said that the measure of a society's civilization lies in how it treats its prisoners. It's not much of a leap to extend that measure to how a society treats anyone who enters the criminal justice system including those who are suspected or accused of committing a crime, whether or not they are subsequently convicted. That, of course, is why the right to a fair trial is seen as a cornerstone of a civilised society in the modern age. Some of the core ideas that underpin modern concepts of a fair trial have been around for many centuries. The presumption of innocence, the principle of equality uh, among citizens, the equality of arms, the right to have all parties present at hearings all have roots that in some cases stretch back into the classical era. And the need to treat citizens fairly has often been incorporated into the core documents that shape a nation's constitution and identity, from Magna Carta to the Declaration of Our Growth and the American Constitution. The extent to which these principles have been adopted and applied over the past centuries has of course varied from country to country. But in legal proceedings across the globe, we can find examples of laws, procedures and practices embracing the concept of fairness. Scots law has long prided itself on a tradition that places fairness at the heart of its legal system. And it has developed its own unique blend of measures and principles to safeguard that tradition. There is a principal concern which has informed the development of such principles and measures in most modern democratic societies. And it is that a process which pitches the might of the state against an individual is not an even or balanced one inherently. The state has at its disposal many resources which it could deploy, if it so wished, to overwhelm, oppress or victimise the individual. It is no coincidence that the principal codification of the fair trial that now overlays national traditions, that's Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights, was developed in the shadow of authoritarian regimes which showed an utter disregard for the rights of the individual and which, in which the rule of law was suborned to the interests of those in power. It's worth bearing in mind the key elements of Article 6 of the European Convention of Human Rights, which are an entitlement to a fair and public hearing within a reasonable time by an independent and impartial tribunal established by law, the presumption of innocence and certain minimum rights for an accused, which include, and this is very important for today's purposes, to be informed promptly in a language in which he understands and in detail of the nature and cause of the accusations against him, the right to have adequate time and facilities for the preparation of his defence, with rights in relation to the examination and citation of witnesses and representation, and the right to have free assistance of an interpreter 
he cannot understand or speak the language used in court. Many of these principles are of general application. Regardless of who we are, our background, position, or skills, we all require the protection of the presumption of innocence, the assurance of due process in front of an impartial tribunal, and the security of having our hearing take place in public. These are some of the basic procedural and legal building blocks of any fair criminal justice system. But the concept of a fair trial extends further than ensuring the rules of law and procedure do not stack too heavily against the accused. The state must also ensure that the accused is properly equipped to have effective participation in his or her trial, which means considering whether an individual's specific circumstances present difficulties uh, or barriers to participation. The most obvious example of this is in legal aid. An accused has a right to legal representation, and if he or she cannot afford to pay a lawyer, the state has an obligation to provide the representation free of charge in the interest of justice. The right of an accused to effective participation in his criminal trial includes the right to be present and the right to hear and to follow the proceedings. In the context of a vulnerable accused, indeed any accused, Effective participation requires that the accused has a broad understanding of the nature of the trial process and of what is at stake for him, including the significance of any penalty which may be imposed. It means that the accused should be able to understand the general thrust or assisted to understand the general thrust of what is said in court, if necessary, with the assistance of an interpreter, lawyer, social worker or friend. The accused should be able to follow what is said by the prosecution witnesses and, if represented, to explain to his own lawyers his version of events, point out any statements with which he disagrees, and make them aware of any facts which should be put forward in his defence. What is required by Article 6 is that the vulnerable accused, assuming fitness to stand trial, be placed in a situation exactly equivalent to the non-vulnerable accused. The vulnerable accused must be dealt with in a manner which takes full account of his or her disability, with steps being taken to promote his ability to understand and to participate in the proceedings, including conduct of the hearing in such a way as to reduce as far as possible his feelings of intimidation and inhibition. And it's within that context of securing effective participation in criminal proceedings that I'd like to look at the needs of those with learning disabilities, particularly uh, an accused, and how they're currently addressed, and how they might be addressed in the future. It's fair to say that there has been, over the last decade or so, an increasing awareness of the challenges facing people with vulnerability, vulnerabilities in relation to the criminal justice system. But it's probably also fair to say that most of the attention of the legislators in recent years has been on the vulnerable complainer or witness. Examples uh, could easily be given. But attention has also been given to the needs of the accused. The Carloway Review of 2011 looked at the support given to suspects in police investigations, including vulnerable <coughs> suspects. And that review led to the Criminal Justice, Justice Scotland Act 2016, which we'll come to later. So there is an increasing recognition that almost all of what can be said and done about vulnerable witnesses applies equally to a vulnerable accused. And if we are serious about a fair trial for the accused, sometimes more so. How real is the right to follow proceedings and to participate in them if the language, concepts and conduct experienced in court are alien to the accused? This recognition was well expressed by the English High Court Judge Sir Nicholas Green in opening an international conference on vulnerability in criminal justice systems last year. He said, protecting the vulnerable goes to the root of the quality of justice and it should be seen as a central component of a fair trial. The trial process is perfected when those giving evidence do so to the best of their ability and in the most accurate and comprehensive way possible. And this is quite irrespective of which side of the trial divide they are on. It matters not whether the witness is a defendant, a complainant, 
or a victim or a third party. And he went on, those who suffer from vulnerability are or may be inhibited in giving of their best. They may be overwhelmed by the court process. They may not understand or be confused by the questions posed to them, but be unwilling or scared to seek clarification. Exactly the example that was given to us early this morning by Steve Robertson. They may be in awe and cowed by the authority figure before them and simply submit and agree regardless of whether this is the truth or the whole truth. When this happens, truth is compromised and justice is weakened. In a civilised society, ladies and gentlemen, we simply cannot accept a situation in our trial process where truth is compromised or justice is weakened. We need carefully to scrutinise the measures that are avail available to support the vulnerable through the criminal trial process and consider what more can be done. If we look at what exists at present, there are two main areas where provision is currently made. The first is the appropriate adult scheme, of which you've already heard something this morning, designed to help suspects through the initial police investigation. The second is the suite of what I refer to as special measures to help witnesses, including an accused, cope with giving evidence in court. So far as the police questioning of vulnerable adults is concerned at the moment, the vulnerable adult suspect enjoys no formal legal status uh, and no formal legislative protection, although that is about to change. However, a practice has firmly been established whereby a vulnerable suspect must be provided with the services of an appropriate adult during police questioning. The practice dates back to about 1990 uh, and guidance given then by the Scottish Office, which required the attendance of a person who, because of their expertise and or their training in dealing with those with uh, learning uh, difficulties, could facilitate the interview. Such a person was to be known as an appropriate adult, and the purpose of their involvement was to facilitate communication and to ensure as far as possible that the interview <coughs> process was fair. The current approach to vulnerable adult suspects remains focused on the need to secure the presence of an appropriate adult at interview. Um, the function of an appropriate adult hasn't changed. The need to make appropriate adjustments is reflected in the Crown Office Manual of Guidance uh, on solicitor access, sorry, the uh, police guidance on uh, solicitor access that where officers have reasonable grounds to believe that an adult suspect may be unable to advise if they wish a private consultation with a solicitor prior to interview due to mental disorder or lack of capacity, the services of an appropriate adult must be sought to assist in explaining the suspect's rights. Now, fairness is at the heart of this issue. And in this context, fairness requires that any suspect who is vulnerable is promptly identified as such and is not subject to any disadvantage by reason of disability. So far as a right to a fair trial is concerned, what requires to be secured is the ability of the vulnerable suspect to understand the nature and potential significance of police questioning, the nature and extent of his rights, and to exercise them in a meaningful way. This is important, not just in the interests of the individual accused, but in the wider public interest since failure to arrange the attendance of an appropriate adult at interview of a vulnerable suspect may well result, quite rightly, in the interview being held to be inadmissible. The interviewing police officer should explain to the appropriate adult the circumstances in which the individual came to be in police custody and the reason for the interview. The appropriate adult should have an opportunity to speak with the suspect prior to the interview in order to explain their role and to assess the communication capabilities of the suspect. The appropriate adult must make it clear to the accused that they are impartial, they're not entitled to withhold from the police any information divulged by the suspect, but it is the appropriate adult's responsibility to ensure that the suspect understands his or her rights of access to a solicitor and all aspects of the caution. They should ensure that the police questions are fully understood by the suspect and likewise that the answers given are fully understood by the police. Apart from facilitating communication, the appropriate adult 
should not intervene or object to any questions. Of course, one of the issues that sometimes arises in relation to police interviews is an overestimation of the communication um, abilities of an individual, perhaps failing to uh, build in the effect of stress, uh, the effect of the uh, nature of the place where the uh, communication is taking place. And from this morning's presentation, it appears that that is a risk that sometimes appropriate adults fall into as well. In relation to police questioning, I mentioned earlier the review conducted by my colleague Lord Carloway in 2011, which noted that no express provision was made for vulnerable suspects and that additional protections analogous to those for child suspects were required for the vulnerable. The review indicated that it was aware of anecdotal evidence of the services of appropriate adults being withheld from uh, appropriate, uh, from vulnerable uh, suspects. The review's recommendations have been taken up by the government in the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016, which confers for the first time formal legal status and specific protection on vulnerable adult suspects. It provides for the identification of such suspects in police custody and for the provision of additional support to facilitate communication between them and the police. <coughs> uh, how this is, will uh, develop remains to be seen, of course, uh, but in practice, the support is to be provided by an appropriate adult, uh, although the term isn't actually used in the Act. Effectively, this puts the current practice on a statutory footing. Interestingly, in Section 98 of the Act, appropriate adult support is defined not only in relation to uh, support during police interviews, but uh, such other support for vulnerable persons in connection with a criminal investigation or criminal proceedings, as Scottish Minister specified by regulation. This appears to contemplate the possibility of the scope of formal appropriate adult support being extended by subordinate legislation beyond police interviews uh, and perhaps into the prosecution and trial process. Additional powers are conferred on the Scottish Ministers to provide by subordinate legislation for conferring the function of ensuring the availability of appropriate adults Assessing the quality of appropriate adult support, something again which you might think highly relevant following this morning's presentation, and providing training to appropriate adults, something else uh, perhaps arising out of this morning's presentation. Accordingly, in the coming years, we can expect to see a formalization of appropriate adult services. At present, it's for each appropriate adult service throughout Scotland to allocate resources and to determine the nature and scope of its services. This may mean that the availability of support varies throughout the country. It may also mean that the nature of the support varies, uh, and certainly something of, of that nature appears to have been the experience of Steve Robertson. Uh, the new powers conferred upon the ministers appear to contemplate a national service with Scotland-wide supervision and training, which should, in theory, lead to a degree of consistency across the country, both in the nature of the quality and availability of support. The powers have yet to be acted upon, but it will no doubt be an interesting area to watch. The other area that I mentioned was special measures. These may come into play in several circumstances, so far as witnesses are concerned, but for our purposes, the important ones relate either to individuals under 18 or where there is a significant risk that the quality of evidence to be given by an individual may be diminished by mental disorder, which covers mental illness, personality disorder, or learning disability, however caused or manifested, or fear or distress associated with giving evidence. The quality of evidence is defined in terms of completeness, coherence, and accuracy. The suite of special measures which exists are, as I think I've referred to, principally designed to make it easier for a vulnerable witness to give evidence rather than to address the needs of a vulnerable accused. <coughs> but insofar as accused persons themselves may give evidence, the measures do apply to them, with some exceptions. The measures include the taking of evidence by a commissioner, in which a witness is questioned in advance of the trial, out with the courtroom, 
uh, subject to audio-visual recording. The giving of evidence by the use of a live television link from outside the courtroom. The use of a supporter, which is a person nominated by a vulnerable witness, to be present alongside that person while they're giving evidence. That person's known as a supporter, who takes no active role in the proceedings, uh, and obviously can't prompt the witness. Um, it's a different role also from that of the appropriate trial, uh, appropriate adult. During the trial, um, an accused has no legal right to have an appropriate adult present in the court. But the judge has a discretion in the interest of overall fairness of the proceedings to allow an appropriate <coughs> adult to be present to facilitate communication, and that does happen uh, from time to time. Uh, the other measure is the giving of evidence in chief in the form of a prior statement which allows for a previous statement made by a vulnerable witness to be admissible as evidence in chief. Now, all of these measures are available to the vulnerable accused. Although experience suggests, I have to uh, confess, that they are or do appear to be seldom utilised. There are two special measures not available to an accused, but to other witnesses. Um, those are the use of a screen um, the purpose of which is to conceal the accused from the sight of the vulnerable witness. Obviously, that's not something that is um, required in relation to a vulnerable accused. Uh, and the other is excluding the public during the taking of evidence. Now, all of these measures are also without prejudice to any other powers which the court has to control the process of a trial. For example, in the case of a vulnerable accused, it's common for the court to take much more frequent breaks to accommodate the concentration and communication abilities of a vulnerable accused and to require and insist upon greater simplicity in the wording of questions. Uh, I think it is fair to say that the degree to which judges interfere to control the nature of the questioning and to insist on simplicity does vary from judge to judge, but that power is there for the judge if, it, if the court is of the view that the questions are too lengthy, too complicated, uh, or uh, contain more than one uh, point at a time. I think, again, having listened to this morning's presentation, that we are perhaps not sufficiently careful about this. And I hope Sheriff Kubi has made a note of that in his other role. Um, so, to the future. These are the primary uh, measures designed to ensure that vulnerable suspects and accused are supported through the system. Um, it, it's not <coughs> controversial, I think, to say that the design and application of these provisions are not perfect and that there is room for improvement. That's not a criticism of any institution or profession. I know that local authorities and the Scottish Appropriate Adults Network uh, work very hard to provide the service that's required, but we all also know that resources are limited. And it's hard to source the number of suitably qualified appropriate adults that are needed and to have a system whereby they can provide assistance to vulnerable suspects in police stations across the country uh, round the clock seven days a week. Uh, as for the special measures available in court proceedings, there is variation in their use. In some cases, it's not clear that these measures provide the protection that's required. A supporter, for example, can only go so far in protecting a witness from the intimidating atmosphere of the court. And the use of taking evidence by a commissioner is infrequent and varies greatly in quality. And as I've already mentioned, is very rarely used in relation to uh, an accused. It's also increasingly apparent that there's a gap in the range of special measures available, uh, one which is particularly relevant to the topic uh, that we're addressing today. There's currently no statutory provision for someone to assist communication between the court and the vulnerable witness or vulnerable accused, unless, of course, interpretation from another language is required. These issues have been and are being addressed in the process known as the Evidence and Procedure Review. In 2014, I was part of a small group led by Lord Carloway, uh, who was then the Lord Justice Clark, who looked at the scope for the greater use of evidence 
uh, that has been recorded in advance of the trial, out with the confines of the courtroom and the intimidating atmosphere of the court. Our view was that as a general rule, a witness is likely to provide a more reliable, accurate and comprehensive account of an incident if a statement is taken as close to the time of the event as possible, rather than several months later, uh, sometimes a year later, in the stressful setting of a courtroom. And we tried to find examples where these ideas were being used in other jurisdictions. Um, we found uh, that there had been quite a lot of um, use of pre-recorded evidence in other jurisdictions um, and substantial research evidence to the effect that traditional adversarial questioning in court, how we do it, is probably the least effective way to elicit reliable, accurate and comprehensive evidence from witnesses. Uh, and secondly, that such processes are likely to cause further trauma, stress and psychological damage, some of which can be long lasting. Various jurisdictions have addressed these in various ways, many of which uh, impressed us uh, in the course of uh, our research. Uh, one in particular, a major feature of the approach in England and Wales uh, in relation to the treatment of vulnerable witnesses in general is the use of registered intermediaries. And I'm sure you'll be hearing more about that uh, later from uh, Dame Joyce Potnikoff, who is uh, in the audience. Um, intermediaries are specialists in communication drawn from a variety of professions, such as speech and language therapists, psychologists, social workers, or special needs teachers. The role is quite specific, being to help witnesses with communication needs to give their best evidence in criminal investigations and at trial by ensuring that they can understand questions put to them and communicate their answers effectively. As you will hear from Joyce, intermediaries can transform the quality of the questioning process in a very positive way. They are particularly effective in helping witnesses with learning disabilities. When we were researching this matter for the Evidence and Procedure Review, we heard from lawyers and judges alike that once they were benefiting from the advice of intermediaries and the toolkits provided, produced by the Advocates Gateway, which Joyce may also mention, they were surprised by how much better they were able to communicate effectively and appropriately with vulnerable witnesses. Of course, there is a gap in relation to the use of intermediaries in England and Wales something I'm sure, I don't want to tread on your toes, Joyce. Uh, but there is a gap, and it's a very important gap, um, because it, it does not apply to vulnerable accused. Accordingly, a sort of parallel system, if I can put it that way, seems to have crept up, whereby non-registered intermediaries are uh, used uh, in relation to uh, trying to assist uh, vulnerable uh, uh, accused. Um, and so there is this sort of two-tier system. Um, it's clearly not uh, perfect, but it's certainly, to my mind, the idea that of some intermediary must be better than none. But much will depend on the nature of the training that the individual has uh, and the degree of oversight that can be given to the individuals who take on that role. Uh, we uh, have uh, addressed this issue as well as the issue of what uh, the uh, English call ground rules hearings in all cases involving vulnerable witnesses, uh, whereby the judge discusses with parties the measures that are needed to ensure that the questioning of a witness will be relevant, phrased appropriately, not likely to confuse or distress uh, the witness. The intermediary will often have a central contribution to make to these uh, discussions and the court may impose time constraints on the questioning or agree to any other measures that will assist the witness to give evidence. Um, and the judge then ensures that these agreed measures are adhered to when the evidence is recorded. Of course, again, there is a gap because this process does not apply in England and Wales to accused persons. Um, in, uh, in our system, the special measures as I've already referred to apply equally to accused persons as to uh, witnesses. So in our evidence and procedure review, we 
made a number of recommendations. First, that there was a need for sufficient protocols to be in place, supported by appropriate levels of training, to assure that as far as possible there's early identification of a witness's particular needs and access to the support required to meet the needs of the particular vulnerability. And secondly, that serious consideration should be given to introducing the special measure of appointed intermediaries. Because special measures here apply equally to vulnerable accused as to witnesses, that would apply to the accused were it to be introduced. Um, so we were very conscious of the criticisms of the way in which the mean matter had been introduced in England, applying only to witnesses and not to the vulnerable accused. Of course, whether or not such a system is introduced in Scotland is a matter for the Scottish Government. Such measures do require considerable resourcing and, of course, we are at a time when public finances are tight. I expect the Government would need to be assured that there could be a sufficient supply of appropriately, appropriately trained individuals to take on the task. But it is a matter, I believe, that the government is giving serious consideration in light of the evidence and review reports. The report also contained a number of recommendations in relation to the pre-recording of the evidence of vulnerable witnesses generally, uh, advocating a structured approach to this, um, including something akin to a ground rules hearing at which all the needs of the individual were addressed in relation to communication, in relation to uh, how questions can be addressed to avoid being confusing uh, or misleading um, in relation to breaks and, and the like. Although these were principally designed with the vulnerable witness or more, more probably the vulnerable complainer in mind, uh, it's uh, conceivable that uh, if a vulnerable wit accused were to give evidence, uh, his primary evidence could be captured in the same way in advance of the trial. <coughs> is uh, evidence in chief. I focused on what measures are currently or might in the future be available to support an accused person with learning disability. And I am aware, of course, that there are other issues to consider. These include the extent to which decisions about alternatives to prosecution should take into account the vulnerabilities of the accused. Some have asked whether it makes sense to try to keep those who will struggle to cope with the complexity of legal processes out of the courts altogether, to have some kind of uh, diversion. There is a complex legal question of how the fact that an accused has a learning disability might affect an assessment of whether he or she has a necessary state of mind to be found guilty of the offence. And there is a far wider question of what support services in health, education and social work, as well as in justice, are required to help offenders after sentencing or to divert potential offenders from entering the system in the first place. These, perhaps, are issues for another time and place. But it is right that you and we continue to raise the profile of those who are confronted by the authority of the state, but who need support in the course of that process. I started this speech with the suggestion that we should look at how we treat our accused in particular, our vulnerable accused, as a measure of how civilised a society we are. Scotland has a long tradition in this regard. It was over two centuries ago that Voltaire said, we look to Scotland for all our ideas of civilisation. It's perhaps too much to expect Scotland to be the source of all wisdom in the treatment of vulnerable accused, including those with learning difficulties, but we can strive to be a pioneer, a leading light in taking an enlightened and informed approach consistent with our deep traditions of fairness in criminal proceedings. As a civilised society, we must aspire to the highest standards of justice for all those who come before our courts. That requires us to acknowledge that vulnerable accused have specific needs to enable them fully to participate in the criminal process and to ensure that those needs are met as far as possible in the interests of fairness and in the interests of justice.
rooted your observations about judicial training, but I, I think it, it gets the heart of it to talk about effective participation as being fundamental, and certainly as a judicial office holder, and I will probably find it very hard to hear the person at the top of the criminal justice system uh, being so positive about the need to take steps to recognise the fact that one size does not fit all so far as the criminal justice system is concerned, and the very important steps in terms of evidence and procedure, the 2016 Act, that are being taken to try to minimise the stress and so on afforded to people with vulnerabilities. And I think it's very heartening for all of us uh, to know that from the top these things are being taken very seriously. I think it's now time for our coffee break, is that correct? We're going to adjourn for coffee till about a journal, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> 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 for 20 minutes or so.